We're going to read um, one of the Psalms now. We're going to read Psalm 2. We've read a little bit already of Psalm 1. Now we're reading Psalm 2. We're not setting a precedent here. We won't be working our way through every single one of them this evening. But uh, we're going to kick off with a bit of Psalm 2. So um, if you have a Bible with you, turn to Psalm 2, chapter, sorry, verse 1. Uh, If not, it'll appear on the screen so you can follow along there. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them with his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray, shall we? Father, please help us now as we look at your word. We have an incredible book before us, and we pray that you would speak to us. Open our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear you speak and change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this evening, I want us to think about prayer. Um, I wonder how you feel about prayer. Uh, To be honest with you, I find prayer a struggle. Maybe, I mean, we wouldn't do a show of hands, but maybe some of you here find prayer a struggle too. Maybe it's a battle for you on a weekly basis as you try to learn how to pray. But perhaps some of you here are very new Christians, and for you it's just working out, well, what do I pray? What are the rules? What language do I use? What stuff can you pray about? What, What can't you pray about? Um, maybe for some of us, we're, we're seasoned Christians, but we find that when we come to pray, we have a nice warm drink, a list of things we're going to pray about, and we sit down in our chair, and the moment we sit down, our mind turns to something else. We're distracted. We, we can hardly concentrate for a few moments before we finish our prayer. Uh, for some people here, and there will be a few, I'm sure, in a, in a group this size, uh, the problem is our current situation is so intense so painful that we just cannot find the words. I mean, we want to pray. We know we should pray. But what can we say? There is no language. And, and, you know, at the moment we feel so angry, so disillusioned, disenchanted, that even if we could find those words, we're not sure God would want to hear them because we don't want to say the things that we want to say. And and prayer can be very tricky, can't it? And so for, for days like that and for all the days in between, How do we learn to pray? How do we learn to pray better? Well, I think we learn to pray in a very similar way to the way we learn anything else. I mean, most things we learn by seeing and copying, don't we? You learn to do everything that way pretty much in life. And I think prayer is no different. So my daughter, um, my eldest daughter, Phoebe, uh, is three now and she likes to pray. Uh, But how does she learn to pray? Well, the prayers she prays, for example, at the end of the day sound ever so much like the prayers we've been praying with her every night for the last three years. Uh, my eldest niece, who's just coming up on three, she, she really enjoys saying grace. Uh, her name is Kate. And when Kate says grace, um, it's really good fun because Kate always says grace the same. What she does, she, she sits there, she scrunches her eyes up as tight as she can to try and sort of cause her eyeballs to implode or something. And she, she says, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this lunch. Amen. Now, If it's 6 o'clock in the evening, it will be the same grace. If it's 7 o'clock in the morning, it will be the same grace. It's always thank you for lunch. Now, she'll get the nuances of different meals, I'm sure, as time goes on. But she's learned it by rote. One day when she learned how to say grace, it was lunchtime. And so now she always thanks God for for the lunch. Um, And prayer is like that. We learn and then we grow. And Phoebe's beginning to freestyle a bit with her prayers now. And kind of it's quite exciting seeing how her, her young spirituality is developing. But we begin by copying. And this isn't new, is it? Think about how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. When they said, Lord, teach us to pray, what did he do? He didn't say, right, guys, get your notebooks out. Here are the nine Ps of effective prayer. Get these down and remember them and practice them, and you'll be a a killer prayer by the end of the month. That's, That's not how he did it, did he? What did he do? 
he began to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And you can imagine, after hearing Jesus pray, the disciples tried to pray like him. They emulated him and gradually began to pray better prayers. Not that they used all the same words all the time. I'm sure they branched out from there, but the themes, the sentiments, some of the language, I'm sure, was really helpful to them in learning how to pray. And right the way through the Bible, we see all kinds of prayers that can help us to learn how to pray better, that can lend language to us when we have none. And one of the best places we can go to is the Psalms, and that's where we're going to camp out this evening. So what are these Psalms? If they help us to pray, what are they? I'm assuming lots of us here will, will be familiar with some of the Psalms, but what are we dealing with? Well, the Psalms are um, a bunch of books, a bunch of, a bunch of prayers, sorry. The Psalm, uh, Psalms are a bunch of prayers all directed to God. Now, Peter alluded to this earlier. They're prayers um, about God and to God, words about him and to him. Um, they're really vast in their variety. So some of them seem very formal. They would have been organized for, say, the ceremony that would uh, coronate a king. You get some like the one which we just read, which is a coronation psalm. Others feel far more immediate and raw and emotional. And it feels like they're just coming from the depths of a person. Um, Some are cleverly organized poetry, so you get alphabet psalms where every stanza is a different letter of the alphabet going through. Um, But whatever they look like, these psalms are songs to God. They express the emotions of a person at a time in a place. And that can be very helpful for us. As well as being very broad in kind of the the style of the psalms, they're also really broad um, in terms of history. They cover about a thousand years of Bible history, from Moses at the beginning, um, chronologically, all the way through to the end of the exile. Um, the, the final book of the Psalms was probably compiled about the 4th century BC. That would be the one Jesus would have had in his Bible, the one that you have in your Bible today. And these Psalms, as well as being diverse in their style, diverse in, in, in the time frame in which they were written, um, they were also written by many different people. So we know of at least seven different authors who wrote the Psalms. Um, about half of them were written by King David. Another third were um, anonymous, so who knows how many people uh, stand behind those psalms. Uh, Then there were some written by a guy called Asaph. Um, There were some psalmists called the Sons of Korah, who I think sound like a metal band or something. You find them in Kerrang! magazine or something, Um, uh, but they weren't. Um, (laughs) Then uh, there were a couple written by um, Solomon, uh, one written by Moses, another one written by Ethan. And for children of the 80s, this always gets me excited, one of the psalms was written by a man called He-Man, which I think is pretty cool. No Skeletor in the Bible, but there is a He-Man. And so the Psalms are this diverse bunch of prayers to God, and and, and so uh, such a breadth to them. But each of them helps us to understand how we could pray and how others have prayed. And so what I want us to think about this evening is how these can help us in our prayer, okay? But before we go any further, let's explore a bit further, because a lot of us will be familiar with individual Psalms, like the ones we've been singing about, deers panting for water, um, sheep and shepherds, that kind of stuff. There will be Psalms that we go to, um, but it's a bit like those kind of biscuit selection tins, um, and some go very quickly, don't they? So you get those little rings of chocolate with a tiny bit of biscuit inside, they always go first. Um, bourbon creams, they're quite popular, chocolate digestives, and you're, you're left with kind of a stack of rich teas at the end, and no one's interested, and they go moldy. Um, Is the Psalms a bit like that? There are ones that we like and ones that we don't. Or should we look at it like any other book of the Bible? I mean, is it a book like the rest of the books in the Bible, like Matthew or Isaiah or Genesis or whatever? Or is it just that all the Psalms are kind of lumped into a bag, given a shake, and whatever order they came out, that's the order they're in? So, I mean, does it matter that Psalm 17 is Psalm 17 and not Psalm 123? Does it matter that Psalm 1 is at the start and Psalm 150 is at the end? Well, I think it does. And I think if we start to look at the book of Psalms, we see it is actually a carefully organized, edited, compiled book. The first thing you'll see, just just if you've got a Bible in front of you, have a look at the beginning of Psalms, because you'll see it's not actually just one book, um, but it's five books um, divided up. Interesting, it's five. um, Hints back to the first five books of the Bible, which are called the Torah, the teaching. And, And I think what's going on here is this is teaching on how to pray a kind of new teaching on how we should relate to God, um, adding to what was there in the original Torah. And these are divided up. You'll see you've probably got little headings in your Bible that say book one, book two, book three at the appropriate places. They're also concluded, so you can tell this the hand of an editor here, um, always with the words, our men and our men. Well, actually, in books one, two, and three, it's slightly different in book four. Um, but a, a word of praise at the end of each book, it shows you that something's going on here. Someone was thinking when they were putting the book of Psalms together back in the fourth century BC. 
And as you start to look closer, and I've really enjoyed this this week as I've been exploring, and a little bit before then, exploring the Book of Psalms, there are so many marks of an editorial hand. Um, for example, the ending. Um, if you want to, just turn with me to the end of the Book of Psalms. Um, we'll have to be a little bit dexterous this evening to jump around this book. But Psalm 150 and the, the four Psalms that come before that form a kind of conclusion. They're the only Psalms that look like this in the whole book that begin and end with the phrase, praise the Lord or hallelujah. Um, and each of them is like that. And what is happening here as we work towards the end of the book is that the kind of praiseometer is being turned up and up and up and up. And the intensity and the volume is going right up um, each psalm. So you start in 146, praise the Lord. And then at the end of that psalm, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. In 47, 148, 149. And by the time you get to 150, kind of it's up to, everything's up to 11. Uh, and it says, praise the Lord. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him in the, uh, with his, for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise and with the sounding of trumpets and with cymbals and with harps and with lyres and everything. And it gets to the point at the end where every living thing, everything that has a lung in it is breathing out praise to God. Praise the Lord. That's where the book ends. Now, again, no surprise that the only Psalms that look like that come in a little group at the end. And you'll see as you go through, there's tons and tons of other things that point to the fact this is organized. This is meant to be read as a whole. This isn't just a, a, a kind of random assortment of songs. This is more of a, an anthology of prayers. Now, if we've got a conclusion, what would you expect to find at the start? An introduction. And that's exactly what we get. So let's turn there together, shall we? Um, you were probably just there a minute ago, so I've probably annoyed you now. But let's turn back to Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Interestingly, another little note that just shows us that this has been thought, um, thought about as it was put together. Um, every psalm in book one is written by David, apart from these two. Um, all the other ones are from the king. And these two stand apart as a way of setting out the landscape for this book, a way of introducing us to what this is all going to be about. Now, we've already heard um, a little bit from Psalm 1. Peter read it to us, didn't he? At the start, blessed is the one who does not walk in, st in, the, in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And that first person is contrasted in the second half of the psalm with the person who doesn't trust God, the wicked person. And what you see here is the very simple truth that the best way to live is to live distinctively for God, chasing after him, rooted in his word. That is the way to, to true life. That's kind of what is set out in, in Psalm 1. Now, Psalm 2, we, we just read together. And that goes from the very kind of close detail of one person's life or, or two people in contrast that you see in Psalm 1 and zooms right the way out to a global scale. It's talking about the nations, and what you see in Psalm 2 is um, that God... Actually, let me tell you why this was used. Uh, initially, it was a coronation psalm. So back in the day when it was written, it would have been written for someone like King David or Solomon when they were coronated and became king. But when this book, Psalms, was put together in the 4th century BC, there was no Davidic kingdom. The kings of, uh, of Israel and Judah had been... Well, Judah and Israel had been wiped out. And so this had taken on a deeper meaning, a more profound meaning... Um, Israel was waiting for a greater king, waiting for a king who would come and not just rule over their little nation, but rule over the whole world. And then from our perspective, from where we stand, after the New Testament, we know who that king is. That king is Jesus, isn't he? He is the one who, who reigns over everything. He is the one who is king and whose kingdom is established and one day will rule over all the nations and have them as, in, as, as his inheritance. And so what do we see here? Well, we see the nations conspiring against God, but God isn't scared. God isn't intimidated by this. God laughs, actually, because his king reigns. And so this sets out for us, I think, two of the key themes as we come into the book of Psalms. I've tried to sum it up like this and try and shape it to make sense of what this whole book is about. The Psalms are the prayer book of God's people as they strive to live distinctively for him, that's Psalm 1, and await his coming king, that's Psalm 2. These two little psalms at the beginning, which help us to orientate ourselves within the book, they help us to see what these prayers are all about. Who's praying these prayers? Why are they praying them? And it's for people like the original readers or the original writers, and it's for people like you and me, who are desperately wanting to live God's way, striving to be distinctive, but in our job, in our family, 
amongst our friends, that's difficult. Not everyone is going the way that God wants us to go. And so we strive to live that way. We strive to be rooted in his word. And when things are hard, we, we long for the day when Jesus returns. But in the meantime, how do we pray? And often we find ourselves without the words, but the Psalms help us to understand how we can pray in that context. Okay? So that's kind of what's going on here in this book of Psalms. That's what it's for and how it can help us. And we're going to dig into Psalm 2 in a little bit. But just before we do, I want to share just one more thought on the book generally. Psalms tend to split into two camps, basically. You either have Psalms which are lament Psalms or Psalms which are praise Psalms. Um, The lament ones are the miserable ones. uh, And they kind of emphasize or or express what it's like um, to live in a world where there is confusion, where there is pain, where there is anger, um, and the psalmist express that to God. The praise psalms are more expressions of joy or celebration or worship, happiness. And some of the psalms sort of straddle both camps. They move from lament at the beginning to praise at the end. But what you find, you probably only notice this if you read the book through right the way from beginning to end, is that the whole book of Psalms actually moves in that direction too. Uh, You might imagine that kind of lament and praise are sort of scattered in in a fairly random way through the 150 Psalms. But actually what you see, and I I wanted to check this, so I did it this week on on Thursday and Friday. I read through the book of Psalms, and and you see that it's almost like the light is dawning uh, as you come through. Uh, The the, the first book and the second one and the third to an extent are, are far darker than the fourth and fifth. And so as you read this, you experience a journey of moving from darkness to light, from hopelessness to hope, from sadness to joy, from confusion to peace, from lament to praise. You see it in individual psalms, you see it in the whole book, and I think this is the journey that we're to take as as Christians. The, The circumstances don't really change in the book of psalms. They're always being chased by their enemies and beaten up and threatened, their lives are in uh, in danger. But the way they respond changes as they pray, and they move from the darkness as the dawn breaks into the light. I'll give you an example of this. We've seen kind of how it ends with some praise in in Psalms uh, 146 through to 150, but let's look at how the first book really kind of starts properly in in, in chapter 3, in Psalm 3. So you remember, hopefully you're still on that page. Um, Psalm 2 ends with God saying, basically, my king reigns. he is always going to reign. His, his um, inheritance will be the nations. But then in chapter 3, it dives down into the reality of kind of David's present experience. So listen to how Psalm 3 opens up. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise against me? How many are saying of me, God will not deliver him? Look at Psalm 4 at the beginning. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Look at Psalm 5. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. Look at Psalm 6. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. Look at uh, Psalm 7. Lord, my God, take refuge in you. Uh, Sorry, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Do you hear the tone of that early book of the Psalms? But as it moves through, and as the reader follows the Psalms through, the hope is that their experience will be the same. They move out of the darkness, out of the shadows, and into the light. And that is what our experience should be like of life with God anyway. I mean, there will be times that are very dark, times that are difficult, um, but God moves us from lament to joy. That's the experience of being a Christian. Um, I want to now turn in a bit more detail to Psalm 2 because it would be good for us to see how this lands, actually how reflecting on the Psalms, praying the Psalms, changes circumstances, changes ourselves, and changes our actions. So let's have a look at Psalm 2. I've given you a bit of a a kind of rough guide to to what's going on there. Um, It comes in four parts, so just have a look at Psalm 2 with me. Um, To begin with, the the scene is set. Why do the nations conspire the people's plot in vain? Um, These nations are rising up against God and against God's king, who we now know is Jesus. Then, in verse 4, we move on to the second section. We hear what God's response is to all of this. And God, in heaven, laughs. God mocks them because he knows the reality. His king is installed um, in Zion, on his holy mountain. 
Then we hear from the king himself, from the son, from Jesus. I will, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. This is what God says about me, the son says. You are my son. Today I've become your father. And then finally, there's a kind of response section from verse 10. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Now this psalm and many others were taken up by the church to help them to process what it meant to be God's people, to process what was going on when, when difficult things happened. So turn with me now to the last verse I'm going to make you turn to. Uh, if you're getting tired of jumping around, you can camp out here for the rest of the sermon. Acts chapter 4. Acts is the book that retells to us um, the early days of the church. And in Acts chapter 4 and, and 3 before it, um, Peter and John have got themselves in trouble. Peter and John were, were leaders of the church, and um, they were experiencing just how powerful the name of Jesus was. And as they were wandering around Jerusalem, they um, had this incredible encounter with this beggar who can't walk. Uh, he's 40 years old, he's never been able to walk. Um, and because of the resurrection power of Jesus at work in Peter, he can now walk. And this gets the authorities really irritated. Their noses are not right out of joint. And um, they get so annoyed with uh, Peter and John, they call them in for questioning. And uh, they get kind of um, roughed up a bit, sort of verbally, by um, the Jewish leaders there. And all this time, I think the church would have been praying for them, praying for their release, praying for their safety, asking God to, to help them. Um, and then finally, we see that they are released. So look at chapter 4, and we'll read from verse 23. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together and prayed to God. Okay, now listen to their prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? And the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city and cons uh, to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The Christian church was experiencing persecution in those early days. And when the leaders were dragged before the authorities, what were they going to pray I think I know what I would have prayed. I probably would have prayed, Lord, make it all stop. Make it all better. Um, maybe on my weaker days, I might have prayed, Lord, I, I give up. <laughs> if this means prison, if this means worse, I don't want any of it. I mean, probably most of us would have toyed with those kinds of prayers, wouldn't we, if we were in the, the shoes of that early um, congregation, or Peter or John. But you see, the church had been steeped in the Psalms. Uh, they knew the Psalms, they prayed the Psalms. And I think what had happened was that through praying through these psalms, they were able to respond to their situations in a far more healthy way than they could have done otherwise. Respond in prayer, and we'll see later, respond in action as well. And so what happens is, I think they realize that their situation feels very much like the, the context of, of Psalm 2. You've got the nations raging against um, their king, Jesus. The, the nations, being Rome and the Jews, are raging against Jesus, or had done, and are now raging against them. And they realize that situation back then is our situation now. That psalm back then, which was once about a king in Israel, is about King Jesus, and we're his people. This is about us. And so they kind of pray on and they, they process this in light of what they know. Well, who is the anointed king? It's Jesus. And what does God think of this situation? When Pontius Pilate and Herod conspire against Jesus, what does God make of that? Is he intimidated? Is he dumbfounded? Is he confused? Is he panic strucken? Strucken? Struck? Panic? Is he worried? Um, <laughs> clearly, God isn't, is he? God isn't scared. God gets sarcastic. Actually, that's what happens in, in, in Psalm 2. And the same is true here. When, he, when, when the nations then come looking for the church, is God surprised by this? No. 
he is not surprised at all. He, he gets sarcastic. And so they realize that God is not scared by this situation. He's not intimidated by this situation. Why? Because King Jesus is king. Because God's anointed is on the throne. Because God's anointed's inheritance is the nation's. His kingdom exists and will extend until one day it covers all of the earth. And so this little psalm that sounds very much like their situation informs their prayers. They realize that Jesus is bigger than anything that the the Romans or the Jews could throw at them. And so a little prayer like, Lord, make it all a bit better, or Lord, I give up, I'm scared, seems too small, doesn't it? For people who've been drinking in Psalm 2, who've been applying it to their world, a bigger prayer is needed, a more fitting prayer for a king like Jesus. And so what do they pray? Have a look at how their prayer kind of goes on from the psalm, how they apply it in their situation. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That's what they pray. Because they've been drinking in Psalm 2, they breathe out a prayer like that. Make us bold. If it means prison, make us bold. If it means we lose our lives, make us bold. If it means we lose everything for you, make us bold. Just make us people who cannot shut up about how great Jesus is, who will not be shut up about how great Jesus is. Make us people that they cannot stop because he is the king and he reigns forever. And nothing will change that. And the Romans don't scare you. And the Jews don't scare you. And they shouldn't scare us either. Make us bold, Lord. And besides that, faith in him leads to life, to true life, to real life, to full life. Salvation is in him alone. So make us bold. That's their prayer. And that's a big prayer, isn't it? That's a fitting prayer for the king that is revealed to us in in Psalm 2. And I really wonder if they would have prayed like that if they hadn't have been drinking the, the psalms in their prayers. So what does this look like for us? Actually, no, before we go any further, let's see what happens, because this really excites me. Um, they don't just pray. It isn't just talk. Look at verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were, where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. See what's happened. They've heard God kind of speak to them through the Psalms. They've sort of regurgitated that prayer. And God has been working through them. So what could have stopped them in their tracks? Actually, it doesn't become a stumbling block at all. God answers that prayer, which he kind of caused to happen inside them. And the prayer is answered, and they go out boldly. And you see, you read the rest of the book of Acts, the church explodes numerically, and in depth, and in every way. The church grows and grows and grows. So to us, I mean, I doubt this week any of us is going to face imprisonment. It's it's unlikely. I mean, perhaps further down the line in years to come, the church in the UK may face imprisonment for for some of the things which we stand for and will not move on. But for most of us, that's not going to be the case, is it? Uh, But I imagine there'll be some people here, uh, and for them, their family context is going to be hard enough. There'll be people in your family who will make your life hell just because you claim to be a Christian. The fact that you're here this evening, you are going to get so much jip when you get back home because you came to church. Or the fact that you're here and not with your family may just cause resentment for them. It could be really difficult for you to stand as a Christian uh, with, your, in, with your husband or with your brother or whoever it might be. Maybe for some of you it's the workplace. I mean... For some of us, it might seem like our Christianity is quite compatible with our job, but for other people, it can be incredibly difficult. There'll be some people in this congregation who will have passed o- been passed over for, um, for promotion several times just because they're known to be a Christian, because they have biblical ethics, and these don't necessarily uh, make as much money as other forms of ethics. And so in their business, in their sector, um, their input is not as welcome as that of others. You know, there'll be people here for whom standing strong for Jesus does mean carrying a cross. It does mean that life is harder. And so when we face those situations, I I think reflecting on something like Psalm 2 could be incredibly helpful to us. Uh, Praying through that psalm, just taking the words of it and praying it back to God could be incredibly helpful. And then as God works that into you, thinking, "What, what does that mean for me? It means that I don't pray the prayer, Lord, I give up. 
It means that I pray a prayer, Lord, make me strong. It means that I don't stop talking to my family, but I pray that God would give me the strength to talk more to them, to be bold, to be courageous in the way that I reach out. That at work, I don't compromise because I get by easier if I compromise. But I stand just as clearly a Christian as I was yesterday or the day before, if not more so. To pray that prayer and to mean it. And to see how God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, might answer that prayer in your life. This is just one example. The Psalms, as we said at the start, are full of every possible human experience. You see grief, you see joy, you see celebration, you see adversity, you see everything there in the Psalms, laid bare, people's lives kind of before us in in the text. This is just one example for people who are facing a hard time because they're a Christian. Drink in from the Psalms. I mean, the application from this is pretty obvious. Read them, pray them, and see what God does. This evening, don't go to bed without reading a psalm. Find one and read it. I mean, read Psalm 2 if that's helpful to you. Find another one if that would be more helpful. But read these things. Pray them back to God and go on praying. Let them give you words to pray with. And see if God won't turn your small prayers into bigger prayers. Turn your substandard prayers into more fitting prayers for a king like Jesus and a mission like the one that we have. I really hope that these psalms will be helpful to us, um, that we'll take them and we'll use them. I've been spending quite a bit of time in the psalms this week, but I don't often. And I've realized what a waste that has been of a lot of days. So let's take these psalms, let's read them, let's pray them, and let's go on praying and see where God takes us. Should we pray now? Father, we... Thank you that here in the center of your scriptures we find the experience of countless men and women who have lived for you, have longed to be distinctive even when they face trials, who have longed for your return even when it seems so far away. And Lord, we see how they prayed. And Father, when we face times that are just too difficult for us, times where we don't know what to say, where our words fail us and we have nothing uh, that we can pray, Lord, let's go there and drink. Lord, I pray for anyone here this evening who is really struggling. May they find um, just the words in the Psalms this evening that will help them um, to keep on going, to keep on trusting you, to keep on living for you, to keep on hoping in your Savior, Jesus. Lord, please make us people who, who, for whom prayer is more natural. Um, help us to be people who dwell in the prayers of the Bible, who pray them back to you, who go on praying. And Lord, we don't just want to be people who pray. Uh, we want to be people who see answered prayer in our lives. Lord, we want to be like that little church in Acts who prayed and you answered their prayers. And the kingdom grew and the word spread And Jesus' name was honored. Lord, please make that the case here. Make us people of prayer. And Lord, we thank you that you're a God who answers. We thank you in your gracious and glorious name. Amen.